Um, now, I would like to uh, present you uh, the distinguished speaker of today, um, Dr. Margaret Chan. Uh, as all of you know, that uh, she was the former uh, Secretary General of the World Health Organization, and now she is also acting as the inaugural dean of the Wanke School of Public Health at the Tsinghua University. Um, Dr. Chen uh, attained her medical degree uh, from the University of uh, Western Ontario in Canada. And then uh, he jo she joined the Hong Kong Department of Health in 1978. Uh, in 1994, uh, Dr. Chen was appointed as Director of Health of Hong Kong, the first woman uh, to hold that position. She launched a, a number of new services to prevent the spread of disease and promote better health. Uh, she, under her leadership, uh, Hong Kong um, effectively Excuse managed me. the outbreak of SARS. Mm -hmm. In 2003, Dr. Chan joined the WHO as a director of Department of Protection of Human Environment. Uh, and uh, in 2006, November, uh, she was elected to the post of the Secretary uh, Director General of the WHO, the first uh, Chinese national uh, to lead a major international organization. Under her two terms of, uh, as uh, Director General of the WHO, WHO has managed to achieve uh, many uh, progress. Uh, as I noticed that um, uh, the number of people dying from the malaria and HIV uh, has been cut in half uh, during that period. And also in 2015, the number of child deaths dropped below to 6 million a year uh, for the first time, uh, almost 50% a decrease in any uh, deaths since 1990. Uh, WHO also managed the Ebola outbreak in 2014 and also the Zika virus outbreak a year later. Uh, WHO also uh, you know, played an important role in making uh, universal health coverage as a core element of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So I think based on uh, Madame Chen's rich you know, experience uh, in leading the World Organize, uh, Health Organization over the years, I think uh, it would be great opportunity uh, for her to reflect on the global health security of today. Uh, she will uh, speak about 20 minutes and then there will be five minutes Q&A moderated by Malaysia. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Chen for her speech. Well, first, let me thank you, Professor Chen, for your very kind introduction. And I would like to say how happy I am uh, to be joining you. And thank you for this opportunity to meet with so many friends, new friends, old friends, colleagues, and from around the world. Well, truly, it is a great pleasure to attend this Association of Pacific Rim Universities, APRU Global Health Conference, and share with you my reflection on global health security. In terms of history, it is wide, widely known that the World Health Organization issued its first set of legally binding regulations in the 1950s, the aim of which is to prevent international spread of diseases. Concern at that time focused only on six quarantinable diseases, cholera, plague, relapsing fever, smallpox, typhus, and yellow fever. New diseases were rare at that time. People traveled internationally by ship, and news travel by telegram. Since then, profound changes have occurred in the way humanity inhabits the planet. The disease situation is anything but stable. 
Very few threats, health threats, are local anymore. Climate change, population growth, rapid unplanned urbanizations, intensive farming practices, environmental degradation, and the misuse of antimicrobials, etc. These are challenges. Challenges that have disrupted the equilibrium of the microbial world. We are seeing a dramatic increase of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases around the world. Airlines now carry more than 4.5 billion passengers every year. And that was the 19, uh, 2019 data. This kind of travel has vastly increased the opportunities for the rapid international spread of infectious diseases as what we have been seeing this year. The COVID-19 pandemic is caused by a new coronavirus. In a world that is characterized by profound mobility, economic interdependence, and electronic interconnectedness, the health threat has left no country untouched. Real-time news allows rumors and panic to spread with equal ease. Shocks to health, shocks to economies, and business continuity reverberate around the world. The impacts of this pandemic extend far beyond the sickness and death caused by the virus itself. It has highlighted the inequalities and divisions in our societies. This disruption to health systems threatened to unwind decades of progress. Progress against maternal and child health, progress in many other important diseases, as Professor Chen has just alluded to. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, our concerns have become reality. In August, the World Health Organization issued a survey report on the impact of the pandemic on the provision of health services. 105 countries from five regions of WHO were surveyed during March to June of 2020. 90% of the countries indicated that their health services were severely affected by the, by the pandemic. And of course, as we all know, the middle and the low income countries, they were bearing the brunt. While the hospitals were overwhelmed with managing COVID-19 patients, the clinic services were also seriously affected with 60 to 70% of service cancellation for routine immunization, non-communicable diseases for treatment, and family planning, mental health, and cancer treatment. Malaria and TB reported more than 40% services closed. About 20% of emergency services, blood transfusion services, an emergency service, including surgery, were all canceled. And of course, the reasons for cancellation or closure were cited by countries. They are due to lockdowns, financial hardship, closure of centers because the staff have to be deployed for the epidemic control and shortage of medical supplies due to interruption of the supply chain. And the reason are many. Friends, this disruption has severely compromised global health security and indeed reversed decades of progress in health and economic development. Hundreds 
of millions of people have lost their jobs. Anxiety, fear, and uncertainty abound. The global economy is headed for its sharpest contraction since the Great Depression. This once in a century pandemic has hammered home a critical lesson. The critical lesson is when it comes to health, our vulnerability is universal and our destinies are intertwined. We know from experience that any prolonged health crisis is bad for the economy because people don't feel safe going out, going to school, to shop, to travel, and doing business. People's risk avoidance behavior is a strong driver for economic contraction. China's economy is bouncing back. Why? What lessons can we distill from her experience? Her experience in controlling the epidemic very quickly and paving the way for economic recovery. I have five observations. First, strong leadership from the top to take decisive action for protecting people, to respect science and evidence for the epidemic control, and to mobilize the whole of government and the whole of society for action. Second, ongoing improvements and innovation in the public health measures to protect the health system's integrity and to protect the healthcare workers. Third, acceptance of the general public to endure some very drastic health measures like social distancing, wearing masks. They see that as a responsibility to the society. Four, real-time application of digital technology to support non-pharmaceutical interventions like testing, contact tracing, and quarantine. Fifth, a pro poor financial and health insurance strategy to make sure that all patients have unfettered access to healthcare. The above collective efforts have contributed to China's strategic success in containing the epidemic very quickly. Now, vigilance and public health measures are the new normal. And they stand ready to deal with any flare-ups and setbacks. And because of this, people feel safe and secure going out, going to do their business, either to school, to shop, to travel, and to do business. Such activities are key to economic active recovery. And this is happening in many cities in China and they are growing. I'm sure, friends, you have seen pictures where thousands of people were photographed visiting the Great Wall of China and other Chinese scenic locations in early October during the holidays. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, as the Northern Hemisphere is entering the cooler autumn and winter seasons, and this is also the season, the peak season for respiratory infections, and people tend to stay home to stay indoor more, and the virus spread more easily. As we are speaking, we are hearing that some countries are seeing a resurgence of pandemic outbreak. I think what we can do is we need to do several things to reduce our risk of infection. It is wise to get the influenza vaccine 
especially for the elderly, like myself. It is important to avoid crowds, maintain social distancing, wash hands frequently, and wear a mask going out. It is also smart to get vaccinated when a safe and effective vaccine against COVID becomes available. Here, I would like to commend the Chinese government for their commitment to keeping President Xi's promise of making the vaccines a global public good. China has joined COVAX, a global cooperation and coordination mechanism for fairness and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines for resource-constrained countries. Ladies and gentlemen, when we look at history of human civilization, we will find that viruses and human beings are in constant struggle. After the H1N1 influenza pandemic in year 2009, the World Health Organization had already warned, and let me quote, the world is ill-prepared to respond to severe influenza pandemic or to any similar global, sustained, and threatening public health emergency, end of quote. Since year 2009, we also had MERS in 2012, H7N9 avian influenza in 2013, Ebola in 2014, Zika and 20, in 2016, and COVID, of course, in 2019. This, ladies and gentlemen, these frequent occurrence remind us time and time again that our vulnerability to health is universal. We must abandon prejudice and discrimination and choose unity and cooperation in times of health threats for the sake of our global health security. The COVID-19 pandemic is indeed a very loud wake up call. I hope this time around, the international community will wake up to uphold the values of solidarity, diversity, fairness, mutual respect, and strengthen cooperation. And here, universities of the world, and particularly APRU, have a very important role to play. Let's work together to overcome the current crisis and build back resilient health systems with better preparedness for global health security. And on that, let me thank you for this opportunity to share with you my reflection. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan, uh, for sharing your wisdom and expertise with us. And we have a number of questions. So let me start by asking you a question from one of our students uh, from Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. And he is a medical student and he says, in, in your opinion, what can medical students or, or I guess any students, because we have many students joining the conference, what can they contribute to mitigate the negative effects of the pandemic or which competencies should students uh, now develop? Thank you for that important question. And let me first and foremost, thank the medical student from Mexico for asking this important question. Well, let me tell you the bad news first. Young people should be prepared for difficult times ahead. 
in terms of economy, in terms of social development, health, and also, well, at least for you, for you as a medical student, you are still going to school. But for people who need to look for a job, the job market is difficult. That is the bad news. And that is what the global community and the global conversation is about at this point in time. But I believe, I have always believed in people, especially young people. I believe in young people and people's resilience. In time of adversity, we have to work with each other. We have to support each other. And never forget, we are in the down cycle of things. In time of adversity, this is the best time to really build up your own capacity, either through learning, through hard work, and don't forget to make good use of ICT technology to remain connected with your friends and with your colleagues. Now you ask an important question about competences. I think it is a good time to reflect on the global situation and how different countries we respond to this COVID pandemic and begin to synthesize for yourself the values, the values that you treasure most to make this a better world for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question comes from a very um, wonderful um, collaborator and friend in Malaysia who asked, what is our compass or guide for us to get back on track to meet the SDGs? Excellent question, my dear friend from Malaysia. As I have said in my um, reflection, the sad thing is the world was making excellent progress in terms of women's health, in maternal mortality, child mortality, they were all reduced. And diseases across the board were improving. Well, perhaps with the exception of NCD. Now, what is our compass and our guide in the post pandemic era? We need to build back, as I said, a resilient health system, a health system that would address not just health crisis, we, we call it preparedness, uh, a health system that is able to uh, be vigilant and to manage well, new and emerging infections, that is what we call uh, preparedness. But by and large, yes, we see frequent occurrence of new disease and outbreak. But when the world comes together, we can always manage that. But more importantly for me is the health system resilience to make sure the life expectancy, the maternal and child health, the family planning, and all the immunization and all the important diseases are being recovered and gain back all the loss, you know, during this crisis. So that is to me a very important conversation. And for your um, information, as I, I know well, uh, the World Health Organization will be having a conversation with countries of the world to talk about non-COVID uh, um, uh, health issues that are important for the world. Thank, Thank you, you so Melissa. Much. Thank you. Uh, so our next question comes from the University of the Philippines, Vanilla. And she asks, uh, how long do you anticipate that COVID will stay with us if we don't have a vaccine? Do you think that, are you expecting a decline phase or will it just continue? 
Thank you for that question. Uh, that is the most difficult question. And I've been asked <laughs> many times, when do you see an end to COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Well, as someone who have managed so many new and emerging infections, I have a lot of uh, respect for new viruses. Humility is something that we need to be careful. I would not wish to give you a date and to make any prediction as to when we will see the end of COVID-19 pandemic. But we can take ways and means to protect ourselves from getting COVID-19. Now, before we have a safe and effective vaccine, there is no replacement of the basic public health means, what we call the non-pharmaceutical interventions, like wearing a mask when you need to go out, social distancing, and for the government, when you detect a case early, you need to do contact tracing immediately and quarantine suspect and try to hospitalize and provide treatment to the people that are diseased. So there are different ways to deal with different situations. For an individual, you know, as I said, those public health measures are important. Now, if indeed there is a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine, it would be wise to take protection by taking the vaccine. Of course, that uh, brings an, uh, in another important question. The level of protection depends on the level of people within a community that is getting the vaccine. We call it herd community. Now, if you don't have enough people taking the vaccines, there are still people in any community with no protection because this is a new virus and people do not have antibodies against it and do not have the natural uh, immunity other than the infection and the uh, a vaccine itself. So my advice is that do take the vaccine when it becomes uh, available, a safe and effective vaccine. And of course, COVAX, uh, you know, spearheaded by the World Health Organization and Gavi and many countries, are making vaccines affordable and available to resource constrained uh, people, uh, taking a risk-based approach and an ethical approach uh, to uh, uh, allocate limited amount of vaccine to people in uh, great need. So it would be good to follow uh, the conversation and the discussion uh, from WHO and from Gavi. Over. Okay, it looks like we are now out of time, but I we so much appreciate you uh, taking time out of your very busy day to speak to us. It's, it's been my absolute delight. I, all of my friends have made fun of me that I've been counting down the days until we could have you speak. So thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, APRU, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for the all of your questions. I, I'm, I could have spent many more hours uh, listening to her, but we have to move on because we have a lot of other wonderful speakers lined up for you today. So on behalf of uh, uh, Vice President Chen, uh, I would like to now close the opening ceremony